Hi, it's Robin. Here's my collection of 8-bit Commodore and compatible floppy disk drives. It's far from complete, but I have many of the models here and some of the major variations as well. And today we'll go through them in roughly chronological order, which happens to be roughly in reverse order of weight. So we'll be starting with these big ones at the bottom. We'll look inside some of them and also hook some of them up to the PAT Commodore 64 and use them so you can see them and hear them in action. Most of these drives I picked up over the years, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, when these things were literally being thrown out. Sometimes I'd hear a school was getting rid of stuff, and I'd go rescue what I could. So while I've tried to clean them and fix them up, some of them led rough lives at the hands of students, and in some cases I've deliberately left a little bit of their past lives visible. I'm not really into retro writing. If you want to see that kind of thing, you can check out some excellent channels like The 8-Bit Guy or Jan Beta. Okay, I'm going to clear my table here, and we'll go through these drives one by one. Now, Commodore used two different types of drive interface on their 8-bit computers. This is a third-party drive, the MSD SD2 Super Disk Drive. And this is a great drive. I think it's highly sought after. And one of the reasons why is that it actually has both drive interfaces. It has both the parallel IEEE 488 and also the serial, which is often known as the IEC that the Commodore VIC-20, 64, and so on use. So the parallel typically was used on the PETs, and then Commodore wanted to cost reduce when they made the VIC-20, so they went to this serial interface. Now the serial interface is extremely slow, famously slow. When they went from the parallel to the serial interface, I believe the engineers thought they could make it fairly fast by depending on a hardware shift register built into the VIC-20. And it turned out that that chip they chose had a bug in it, and so they had to rewrite it to just use software to do the bit shifting. When the Commodore 64 came along, they could have fixed it because the chip that they selected for the C64 did not have that bug, but either due to backwards compatibility or just time constraints or whatever, they did not fix it. And so the C64 had its slow disk drive, at least by default. There were several solutions to that. And it wasn't until the Commodore 128 that they fixed it, and they called that fast serial and it's backwards compatible. So if you want more info about the IEEE 488, the parallel and serial and the history of that, check out the excellent article on pagetable.com. I'll put a link in the description below. Now IEEE 488 parallel, that actually goes all the way back to 1975 and it's a standard that Commodore adopted, but it was only a standard in the sense that defined the, the physical characteristics of it, the electrical and a simple protocol, well, I shouldn't say simple, but a basic protocol, but didn't define the actual commands, so Commodore implemented their own version of it. So it uses the same cable as other IEEE devices, but that doesn't mean that the devices are compatible with those other computers at the software level or at the operating system level. So this is what that cable looks like. Each one has a pass-through connector on it on the one end, but Commodore implemented their own version of it with a flat edge connector here. Let's see the side up for where it says Commodore. And these cables with the one true IEEE connector and this flat edge one are fairly rare. So I'll show you on the back of my pet here. This is the IEEE connector here. Kind of bizarrely it's the same as the user port connection over here. So you see that's how it attaches on the one end. And that gives you the regular IEEE connector here. So because these cables became fairly rare, but you could find regular IEEE cables like this one that have both ends. Jim Brain made this adapter here, PET to IEEE adapter, and it hooks into the PET on the one end and then gives you the standard port on the other. Okay, so I've got my PET model 4032 here and the 4040 drive, and we'll try formatting a disc in it. I've got a brand new box of KAO discs, 
double sided, double density. These are actually single density, but double density is fine. Higher density, but not high density is totally fine. So brand new box. I have been saving it. I open it up. Whoa. There we go. This is full of 1980s air. Hmm. The 80s didn't smell so good. There we go. A brand new disc. Now these dual drives, this is device 8, and strangely this is drive 1 and drive 0. I believe from the factory this should be drive 0 and this drive 1, but for whatever reason it's swapped in both of these drives, and I haven't changed them back. I don't want to mess something up just for some weird sense of order. And we'll do the command here. We're opening the command channel. We're calling it file number 15. That could be any number, but uh, one of the books I read first used 15. 15 is the secondary address. It indicates that's command channel, that you're not opening a file for data reading, but you're actually going to instruct the drive to do something. And then you can send the command, the N for new, and that's drive unit zero. And the name, we're just going to call it 4040, just so we can keep track of it. And drive zero. And given an ID, we'll just call it 40 as well. That's supposed to be a unique ID that the drive will use to detect, in some cases, whether the disk has changed. So I'll go ahead and run that. And while that's running, the pet is actually free to continue doing other things because the processor and the drive is taking care of doing the formatting. But we can issue a close 15 command. And we'll do a catalog. There we go. And you'll notice it has 664 blocks free that's the same as on a 1541. This disk drive and this disk format is just the predecessor to the 1541, and they're actually read compatible. And they can be write compatible as well, but it's kind of flaky. I'm just going to write a little program called status, and what this does is reads the command channel to check for errors in the drive. So again, we'll just open 15, 8, 15, and then we will input from file number 15, A string, B string, C string, and D string. And then we will simply print those out as well. And then we'll close the channel. Okay, let's try running that. And it should report that everything's okay. And now I'm just going to save that. Now, I didn't indicate the drive number, but the drive is smart enough to search between the two units. And again, we'll do a catalog. You can see that the file is saved there, reducing the blocks free by one. Actually, I'm going to power cycle the drive. Now I'll run that program and you'll see the status. So you see this is CBM DOS version 2 that this particular drive has. As you probably know, each Commodore drive is a self-contained computer with a processor and RAM input-output. And on ROM it has a version of DOS. The DOS actually isn't stored in the computer. That's not loaded in the computer. The DOS is inside each disk drive. And there's just a standardized way through these open commands and so on to send commands and to load and save files. But the disk operating system itself is contained inside the units. And this new disk box actually contains some new write protect tabs and labels. I'm going to use one of those labels. 
I'm just going to write that this was formatted in the 4040 drive 0. We'll show that again later to show how the drives maintain backwards compatibility. I'll swap this one out for the 8050. This disk drive has actually been modified to have a power switch down here on the front. Now I know a lot of people like the computers to be left stock. This was probably modified long ago. But I'm totally in favor of modifications. Remember all these computers were created to be used. And if they're modified to make them more usable for their users, I'm totally okay with that. Now while the 4040 stored 664 blocks, about 170k per disk, this drive actually stores over 500k per disk side. But it doesn't actually use high density disks like these ones for relatively modern drives. It actually uses single density or preferably double or quad density disks which are different than high density. I happen to have the user's manual for the five and a quarter inch dual floppy drives here and it covers all these models the 4040 and 8050 that I have and here are the specifications for it. See the total capacity 533 248 bytes per disk. Like the controller has a 6502 as does the interface. So there's actually two 6502s in here. We'll look at that in a bit. <laughs> I like this physical material, 18 gauge steel. <laughs> How many specs have that? Eh? Okay, and media, diskettes, standard mini, five and a quarter inch, single sided, single density. Not high density. And here it doesn't even say quad density, although Supposedly those are the best. I did another video about trying to use high density floppy disks on double density drives on the 1541 and they do not work reliably. There's a different coercivity and you can watch that video. I'll put a link to it below, but I demonstrate how it's not reliable. If you have one of these, don't use high density disks. Use, well, single density or better double or the rare quad density disks. Okay, I've got the 8050 drive here, and like on the 4040, this one's even labeled drive 0 and 1, but it's actually drive 0 on this side and drive 1 on this side. This is device 8, but each device can have multiple drives. Well, one or two. I'm not aware of any that have more uh, in the Commodore line. Okay, so I've got another blank disk here, and... On this mechanism, you push in until it clicks, and then you push down the door here. And instead of that long disk command before the open command, we can use the header command that's built into basic four on the pets here. And we'll name it after the disk drive, 8050. And that's drive zero. And the identifier, 80. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, that's done. We'll do a catalog, which you can either type in full as catalog, or like most Commodore basic commands, you can abbreviate it with C shift A. And that's got 2,052 blocks free, which is about three times as much as a 1541 formatted disk or as a 4040 formatted disk, which are nearly the same thing. Catalog is a non-destructive directory listing. It's basically the same as loading dollar sign comma eight, except that doesn't destroy what's in basic memory. The same as in most Commodore 64 wedges, a dollar sign on its own. Something that would be nice if it was built into the Commodore 64. So with this high disk capacity, it's interesting that way back in 1980, Commodore was able to store three times as much data on the same type of media, and the disk drive was a lot faster than what Commodore did in 1982 with the Commodore 64. They had the ability to provide 
fast, high-capacity disk drives, but in the interest of cost reduction, they went with the 1541. Okay, and just to take a closer look inside these drives, both of them open up quite easily. There are screws just located, um, just one on each side, left and right, and then the whole top just lifts up. Ooh, inside are the two drive mechanisms. And then there's the big power supply and two huge capacitors. So the motherboard here is mounted up in the top. So it actually hangs upside down. Good thing about that is it stays really clean. And the most interesting thing about this is that it has two processors. Down here is a 6502, and here is a 6504. And the 6504 processor, I had to look that up, but basically it's the same as the 6507 that is in the Atari 2600 in that it can only access 8K of address space, like the 6507 and the Atari 2600, but this does have an interrupt line still while the Atari 2600 6507 has no interrupts at all. And they communicate through shared RAM, the two processors. So this actually has more power than basically any of the computers that gets hooked up to. And one processor is for controlling all the drive logic, and the other processor is for running the disk operating system and communicating over the parallel IEEE interface. So that's the 4040. And the 8050 is very similar. It does have the different mechanisms. And there's the drives. Again, the huge capacitors and transformer for the power supply. And again with the board layout, but this time we have dual 6502s both here and here date codes of the 10th week of 1981. And here the 6522 chip, that's the input output chip, has a date code of the 36th week of 1980. I believe that's a ROM chip from 1981. So this was made, you know, presumably 1981. And the SFD actually retains this dual processor architecture, but the 2031LP does not. It just has the one 6502. Okay, and next we'll look at this SFD 1001. You'll notice that it actually says 100i, so look out for that on the 1541 in particular. This one was another school board rescue, and somebody modified it by drilling a whole bunch of holes in the side for better ventilation. Okay, I've hooked the 1001 up on top here. I'll power it up. It's interesting that both the 8050 and the 1001 do not spin when you power them up. But the 4040, 2031 LP, and then the 1541 Descendants, they all spin when you turn them on. Yeah, that's the 8050 disc. And we'll try it here. Now this is interesting. It doesn't work on the first try, but on the second run it does. I think that's normal behavior. The SFD1001 is able to read disks from the 8050, but this is a single-sided drive. This is a double-sided drive. So I think the first time you try to access it, it looks for a regular double-sided disk, fails, and then when you try again, it reverts to single-side mode. This drive can read single-sided disks, but of course the other way around doesn't work. Now if I take this disk out and give it yet another fresh disk, and we'll do the header command again, SFD1001, and Drive zero, that's all this has, of course, and ID 10, in keeping with the first two digits of the drive. Are you sure? Nope. Oh. 
But a bad disk warning. I'm going to send an initialize command. All right, and now we'll run that format command again. Nope, still bad. I just had it sat on top of the uh, 8050 drive and it did not want to format disks there. Maybe because the angle is slightly, there's a little bit of a slope. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm sure some of you guys in the comments will say, I told you so. So we're going to try it again. I've got another KAO disk here. There we go. That's the click we were looking for. All right, ready. Now let's try doing a catalog of it. Here we go. 4,133 blocks free. That's a lot. I'm going to put in that status program again. This keyboard is unusual. The number keys are over here, and up at the top row, it's just the punctuation, so you don't use shift to get things like quotes dollar signs, and so on. It can be difficult to get used to. And I'm going to save that. And I just wanted to show what DOS version this drive has. I'm going to reset it. And run the status program again. And it has CBM DOS version 2.7. I know some websites didn't have that record. They just have question marks. So there you go. Okay, I've got two 2031s here. Now this one, even though it says just 2031, this is not the original 2031. The first one was a much bigger, boxier machine. And then they started using the this 1541 style case 2031 LP, supposedly for low profile. Really, this should be a 2031 LP as well, but for whatever reason, they didn't do that on these early labels. I'm going to use this one now, but I just wanted to show you a couple of things. It's got this silver label. Must be a very early one. I had to leave that sticker on it. The House of Computers. Isn't that great? And this terrible <laughs> tape on it. I don't know. I just... Works great. I think that says as is. I don't remember the history of it, but this just amused me enough that I had to leave that. And yes, for the remainder of the video, I won't stack drives. Now, if anybody's concerned about that, TPUG, the Toronto Pet Users Group, once had a locker full of various Commodore disk drives, mostly 1541s, but other models. You walked in there and they had drives stacked eight feet high, piled on top of each other, all the way to the ceiling. And as far as I know, no damage was done. Even though they're plastic cases, they're very strong. I just want to go back to that 4040 disc and show loads it fine. So the 4040 and the 2031 LP are in the same lineage of drives that format disks to 664 blocks free. And this is the direct ancestor of the 1541, well, 1540, we'll talk about that in a bit, and then 1541 drives. Apparently a 2031 LP is almost exactly the same as a 1541, except that has the parallel interface. And I'll use the deload command. run that status. Okay, and I'm going to power cycle the drive again, just so we can see the DOS version. There. CBM DOS version 2.6 2031, and DOS 2.6 is the same one as in the 1541. Okay, thanks for watching, and thank you to my patrons for their support. If you'd like to see your name scroll on one of my 8-bit computers, or check out any of my other benefits, then check out the link to my Patreon page in the description below. I made this video thinking it would be a quick one, and then <laughs> I ended up spending several days making this. I even reshot a bit of it, 
uh, and only covered the IEEE drives. I do want to cover the IEC drives, that's the serial drives that the Commodore 64 etc. uses, and uh, I plan on getting to that soon, but maybe not right away. Alright, thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.